Hi folks, lecture E1. I'm sorry this couldn't be a synchronous lecture. Uh, we will be back to synchronous lectures next week for lecture E2, but otherwise this runs just like a synchronous lecture would. So there's going to be attendance questions, which uh, you'll have roughly 24 hours, probably a little bit more, to, uh, to fill out using the attendance question page as usual. Um, when we come to a question slide, if you do have a question you'd like to submit to me, you can feel free to submit it that way. Of course, you can also post questions to discussions, to Slack, you can send me or the TA an email. Um, all these things are options. Uh, so it's just like a normal lecture, it just happens to be totally asynchronous, but otherwise all of the things we normally do during the synchronous lectures, we're still doing. So look out for that. So a couple of announcements. So homework D2 is out there. It's technically due uh, the day of homework E2, which is the next lecture, Tuesday. Now, normally there would be a late policy, 20% per day after that, but because this is kind of uh, midterm practice, and we're kind of, it's kind of accelerated to make sure you see the content before the midterm. I'm getting rid of the late policy. So even though it's formally due on Tuesday or Tuesday night, you actually get about four more days uh, before it becomes unavailable. And then you can't turn it in late after that. And then the solution set will become immediately available. And that way you'll have the solution set before the midterm. There are a couple of tricks just to keep in mind for the first question. There's two questions on homework. For the first question for that homework, you will be given a PDF, a probability density function, and you will have to generate the random variant generator. So that means taking the integral, the PDF, into a CDF, and then inverting the CDF. Now the trick there, because it's gonna be a piecewise PDF, is that you can't just integrate each piece separately. So the limits of integration really matter. And so when you integrate the second piece, the third piece, and so on, you're going to need to include the accumulation from the previous piece. And so you'll see what I mean by that um, in lecture E2 when we uh, discuss this process uh, specifically or um, in the additional materials that I posted on Canvas. There's a sample solution set on Canvas. There's a help video in Canvas. So there's a bunch of stuff already on Canvas to help you get through this if you want to go ahead and, and uh, give it a shot. So look out for that. The piecewise integration is not simply integrating each piece separately. The integral of one piece relies upon the constant that is carried over from the piece in front of that. And that's all due to the limits of integration. So I've kind of got a hint here that if you're integrating from negative infinity to x, and let's say across across zero, well, that is equivalent to integrating from negative infinity to zero, and then integrating from zero to x. And so you can imagine this red part here on the left is like the previous piece where you're taking that whole chunk from that previous piece and adding it to as kind of an, an initial uh, uh, value that then you're adding on top of in the second piece, which is this blue part over here. Then in the second problem, I give you a cumulative distribution function, a CDF, and then you have to then generate the random variate generator. Now, in the first part, I ask you to actually generate the random variates and then show me a histogram. Now, in the second part, all we need to see is the random variate generator. The trick for that second part is that there's going to be a square that uh, like x squared, like a square in the CDF, that when you take the inverse will cause you to use a square root. Now, whenever you take a square root, it's a plus or minus. And so the big trick for that second part is determining whether you use a plus or a minus. And the way you choose that is you want to make sure that your random variant generator has the same range as the desired range of the random variable you're trying to draw samples from. So hopefully you'll see um, how that works out. Now, when you submit these things, do not just submit a spreadsheet with thousands of rows. That's not gradable, and so that won't count. Now, you can, of course, upload the spreadsheet that you use to generate your histogram for the first part, but your main submission with all your answers should be one document that has clear uh, uh, markings of where your graphs are, where your work uh, is, and it should be very easy for the grader to find. A grader is not going to be able to grade a thousand rows of numbers. So again, you can include that spreadsheet. That way we have that so we can see that you generated the numbers. If we have to check anything, we can go back and check that. But the actual thing, the main thing that's graded will be a document that's not just thousands of rows of numbers. It will be your work as you're deriving those generators and your plots. And then in your plots, this is a 400 level engineering class. So your plots really got to have descriptive titles and axis labels and proper axis scaling. So if you um, have bad plots, you know, at this point in the game, we can take off for that. So, um, so technical graphics, really important. Technical communication, really important. Get those graphs right. Okay. 
So uh, Canvas Activity F, um, that is a Canvas activity which draws from all the previous Canvas activities plus adds a couple more uh, questions. It draws randomly from it, so you can take it multiple times. It'll be slightly different every time. It, you get the highest score from all the times you've taken it. It's meant to help you study for that midterm, and it's meant to also help generate questions for Lecture F because Lecture F is our midterm review, and I'd like you to come there, and if you have some questions, we can just work on your questions through Lecture F. The midterm is gonna be the lecture period after Lecture F, so um, look on Canvas, you'll find sample midterms and other helpful resources. It's closed book and closed notes. It'll, you can get two two-sided handwritten formula sheets. This will be given on Canvas with Lockdown Browser uh, with Monitor, and so you'll be able to show your sheets to the camera, uh, before the exam and then uh, and then work on the exam and then about a week and a half later we'll have a midterm retake and you get the highest score from the midterm or the midterm retake. A uh, reminder is that from now on um, you know lab five and on uh, makes a heavy use of the Kelton uh, textbook so make sure that you have access to that and I provided access to that textbook online if that electronic version that i've provided online is good for you then you can just stick with that but uh but if you really like a paper copy it's a good good time to go and get one all right so in this time i'd normally ask if there are questions if you do have any questions feel free to email me post a discussion post to slack or use our standard bitly questions uh link right here and if you are watching this um on uh zoom then um i will put things in the chat anyway so i can put the questions link in the chat and if you're watching this on the zoom cloud version then you can actually have access to the chat and so I'll, I'll put things there again just like we do during a normal synchronous lecture and then we possibly would have an attendance exercise here i'm going to skip that for now but we'll have attendance exercises later all right so um last time we were talking about probabilistic models and how we use them in simulation and specifically, we were talking about how we need to generate realistic variation in our simulation models, like this one up here, of people arriving to an airport. So rather than coming up with fine-grained models of exactly why people arrive at different times to an airport, we just say, can we build a random model, a probabilistic model, that generates variation with, uh, that's very similar to realistic variation, although it only takes a couple of parameters like mean and variance in order to give us all that variation. So we need to be able to choose those models, normal distribution, uniform distribution, et cetera, that give us that realistic uh, variation in things that um, are kind of known uh, or knowable outside of the system that we compile together. And then how we put all those pieces together, that's what we build into the stochastic simulation. It's kind of like our, our building of our, our hypothetical factory floor. And then after we take all of those random distributions that go into that, um, all of the things like how long does this uh, take before this machine breaks? Um, how long um, do we have between uh, widgets as they arrive to the factory, et cetera, et cetera? Then we put that all into our stochastic simulation logic and we get another random distribution that comes out of that and then we analyze that and that's um, kind of uh, helps us get those performance measures and so you're going to start doing that in all of the labs from now on out in arena so this is a stochastic approach because it is a it makes the, it uses randomness as our source of variation and input modeling is the term we use for selecting probabilistic models that mimic realistic variation that kind of input side of things like arrival times, um, how long until train machines break, um, you know, um, how many passengers uh, are flagged for checking for extra checks uh, at an airport, etc. And so last time that I went through kind of how we're trying to build up a vocabulary of these probabilistic distributions that you will use from now on out for the rest of your career. So you will be expected to know um, the difference between a uniform and a triangular distribution. You will be expected to know that, um, you know, when you might want to use a normal distribution and when you might want to use an exponential and how an exponential differs from a Weibull distribution, et cetera. And so we talked about um, a number of them here. So uh, in this page here, Kind of the bold ones or the ones that are, are not light colored text are the ones that we focus on in this class but i put some lighter colored ones like the beta distribution the log normal pareto Rayleigh, gamma uh uniform discrete um, these are all ones that you probably should eventually learn on your own but we're just kind of going to start out with these here 
Now, I want to then um, jump to some stuff that we I had to skip over for time in lecture D2. And that was that after we went through all of those distributions in the end of lecture D2. So in lecture D2, we had just started talking, we stopped talking, we, we, we introduced the, the discrete distribution. So I talked about the Poisson distribution, I talked about um, the different distributions based on the binomial distribution, and then I had to skip over the Poisson process. And so this is really important, and that's why I want to go back and make sure we've covered this, but there's additional material online underneath the lecture D2 that can help you with this stuff as well. So we've so far been talking about random variables. Now, there is a so-called random process. A random process is an indexed family of random variables. So what I mean by that is if you were to, um, to, to take, say, um, for example, um, you could say, how many people arrived at a particular restaurant by this time? How many people arrived at a particular restaurant one minute later? How many people arrived at a particular restaurant another minute after that? Well, the, each one of those uh, questions represents a random variable. But then if you collect all of them together, and you know, that, then time becomes an index for this family of random variables. So that's what we mean by a random process. And a counting process is specifically a family of random variables where the random variable for each particular time or each particular element of the index is the number of arrivals that have occurred by that time. And so that example that I just gave you about arriving at a restaurant, that is a so-called counting process. Now, a Poisson process is a special type of counting process. So in a Poisson process, this is a process that is associated with a mean rate, which we'll often use the Greek letter lambda for here. And this is a process which represents arrivals. So like arrivals at a restaurant, arrivals at a bank, uh, where there are no simultaneous arrivals. And so no individual can arrive at the exact same time as someone else, or at least when that happens, it happens with probability zero. So it generally um, doesn't really happen. There are um, so-called stationary increments. And so what this means is that the distribution of arrivals that happen between any two times only depend upon the length of time between those two times and not on the actual times themselves. And so if I want to ask, um, what's the district, what, how many people arrived um, between um, you know, five minutes and six minutes into the process? then that answer should be the same as how many people arrived between um, 10 minutes and 11 minutes of the process. So how many more people arrived between 10 and 11 minutes, that should be the same uh, distribution as how many people arrived between five and six minutes, because both of those are the same length intervals. And then independent increments. And so what this means is that the number of arrivals and non-overlapping uh, time intervals are independent, which means um, the number, the random variable representing the number of arrivals between five minutes and six minutes is independent of the random variable that represents the number of arrivals between 10 minutes and 11 minutes. So knowing how many people arrive between five minutes and six minutes doesn't give you any ability to bet and, uh, and win on guessing how many people are going to arrive between 10 and 11 minutes. They're independent from each other. So a, um, a Poisson process has a number of useful properties. And so a Poisson process with intensity or mean arrival rate lambda has the property that the probability, uh, this is what's represented over here, the probability of, um, basically this is a discrete random variable. So for any time t, the probability that the number of arrivals we've had um, up to that time is equal to some number n has this mass over here. And what that describes is the probability mass function for a Poisson discrete random variable. So a lot of people get these things confused. A Poisson process, it's a process but it is a collection of Poisson random variables. So Poisson process, the Poisson random variable is a discrete random variable. Poisson random variable is the number of arrivals in a duration of time. So any duration of time, you give me five minutes or whatever, if they're independent arrivals, then I can say how many independent arrivals do I get in five minutes if they arrive at, at a regular rate, 
then that's described by a Poisson discrete random variable. If I collect all of those up together and say, how many up to time t, how many up to time t plus one, how many up to time t plus two, et cetera, et cetera, that family of Poisson random variables is a Poisson process. Okay. Now we can generate a different random variable if we ask a slightly different question about the Poisson process. What we can say is, let's say we've gotten two arrivals, one at time A and one at time B. What is the time in between those arrivals? This inter-arrival time between the two arrivals is described by an exponential random variable with the same rate, lambda. So the Poisson random variable, its parameter is basically going to be the lambda, the rate for the Poisson process, times the um, duration that we're talking about up until. So it, in n of t, that's the number of arrivals up until time t, well, that Poisson discrete random variable has a parameter called alpha, and it's just going to be lambda times t, and that's going to end up being the alpha. Now, the exponential random variable, which represents the time between two arrivals, is just going to have this single lambda as its parameter. So remember, both of these have a single parameter. A Poisson random variable has a parameter alpha, and a, a, an exponential has a parameter lambda. And so when I give you a Poisson process with parameter lambda, then each Poisson random variable inside that process is going to have an alpha, its own parameter, which is gonna be that lambda times the duration of time since the beginning of the process. And the time in between two arrivals is gonna be described by an exponential random variable the, that its parameter is gonna be that lambda. And so um, this is an extremely powerful, um, uh, Poisson processes are used in a lot of different applications. Um, they are kind of the null model for if you just have random arrivals at a bank, at a restaurant, whatever, then these help sort of describe how many people accumulate at that bank over time. Now you could imagine at a bank that more people might arrive say in the morning than in the afternoon and then later on at night. And so the arrival rate to the bank may change. A Poisson process, a so-called inhomogeneous or non-homogeneous Poisson process. Um, so in uh, the normal Poisson process we talk about is in a homogeneous Poisson process where the rate is constant. Now in that bank example, that is a so-called inhomogeneous or non-homogeneous Poisson process where the rate can change over time where you can have a high rate of arrivals in the morning, a low in the, in the afternoon, and then at a high again, uh, let's say in the evening. And ARENA has the ability to implement non-homogeneous or inhomogeneous Poisson processes through a scheduling variable. And so you can actually generate draws from, uh, you know, you basically can generate inter-arrival times from exponentials where the rate going into that exponential changes over time and you can schedule what that rate is going to be at different times of your simulation. And that allows you to simulate a non-homogeneous Poisson process inside ARENA. All right, so that's a slightly more advanced topic, but that may become uh, more important to you and we will work with scheduling in future labs. All right, um, so, I'm not going to go through this here for time process, but there's a lot of really cool properties of Poisson processes, um, splitting and pooling or merging. Um, these are things that uh, you may have seen in 470. You may see again if you uh, do study a lot of study of queuing processes, queuing networks, and so on. Um, you may have seen um, in 470 this Kendall's notation with a so-called MM1 queuing node. And an MM1 queuing node basically describes a Poisson process. The first M uh, stands for Markovian or memoryless, and that means that the um, arrival rates um, are in the inter-arrival times are exponential, which is all you need to sort of know that if they're independent inter-arrivals and they're exponentially distributed, it's a Poisson process on the inter-arrival times. The second M um, has to do with the service times are exponentially distributed. So, but that first M on that MM1Q basically means it's a, it's a Poisson process. So um, Poisson processes used everywhere, um, relatively few assumptions, pretty powerful, especially once you add the ability to change that rate over time. All right, well, that's all I'd like to talk about about Poisson processes, but 
um, I just want you to make sure that you've seen that and that you know this kind of, um, you understand what we mean by this, um, by down here, what I've summarized here, that a process is a family of random variables and a Poisson process is the one where the random variable inside that family is a Poisson random variable. And that Poisson random variable you could say, well, what is the parameter that goes into the Poisson random variable? The parameter should be alpha. Well, that will be equal to whatever lambda is associated with the Poisson random process and times whatever time you're currently looking at inside the family of random variables. All right. And that's all I'm kind of summarizing down here. This is the exponential parameter. This is the Poisson parameter if we're talking about a duration tau. Okay. All right. So, um, so maybe what we'll do is let's do an attendance question. And, um, and that attendance question, so I'll put that again in the chat if you are following the chat along on the, on the um, Zoom cloud recording. There's the link there. And the question for this one is, um, is what is the difference between a random process and a random variable? Or what is the relationship between a random process and a random variable? That's your attendance question for this point here. All right, let's keep rolling. All right, so we just talked about I selected a probability distribution for, let's say, arrival times at the bank. So um, now the question is, how do I actually sample from that? How do I tell the computer to generate that variation according to the probability density function that I have selected? So that's what we're talking about today, or this unit. And so the um, idea here, let's say, for example, I have um, a device that inspects cracks in an aircraft wing that I'm simulating, and I want to make sure that my simulated device fails according to the distribution that matches reality. And in reality, we found that the failure times, how long until the first failure of this device, tends to be exponentially distributed. And so the question is, okay, great, I wanna put an exponential distribution into my simulation for how often this thing fails, but how do I generate those exponential failure times to begin with? Like, what, you know, what, what do I do to make the computer give me exponentially distributed failure times? And so I have my exponential uh, probability density function here, PDF. And I know then that if I take the area underneath that PDF, it's the region there, that's the CDF. And if I instead plot the area as I sweep from left to right um, over the X, I get this shape of my CDF. And uh, so this is my cumulative distribution function for my exponential random variable. And what we will learn in uh, lecture E2 is that with the CDF, I can invert the CDF like you'll do on the homework that uh, we talked about at the beginning of this lecture. Then if I invert that CDF so that I kind of turn the y-axis into um, the, the input of the function, the kind of domain of the function, then, uh, then if I push a uniformly distributed random ver a number through there, so if I take random numbers that are uniformly distributed between zero and one, and I push them into the y-axis of the CDF, then this uniform distribution on the y-axis gets spread out in this non-uniform way on the x-axis. And so uniformity on the y-axis turns into exponential distribution on the x-axis. And so that's something that we're gonna learn about in lecture E2. So if we have a uniform, a source of uniform variability between zero and one, a so-called random number generator. A random number is just another name for a random variable that is uniformly distributed between zero and one. If we have a random number generator, then we can use it to generate an exponential distribution. And I liken this to if you're playing a game that involves die rolls, 
that die is meant to be a uniform uh, source of randomness. And you can use, you can group together numbers on that die to create all sorts of other types of distributions. And so if you want certain events to happen rarely, then you say, well, I'll associate that uh, event to one face of the die and the common event to all the other faces of the die. And so now even though the die is uniformly distributed across its faces, then when you roll it, the outcomes that come out of that are going to be skewed so that you get a rare event very rarely and the common event very often. So that's as desired. And that's basically what's happening here is that by skewing the assignment between the output of the random number generator and the outputs of our random variate generator, then that creates a non-uniform distribution across our random variates range. And that's what we're gonna do. But in order to get there, then the question is, well, how the heck do we generate this random, this uniformly distributed random number? And so this has been a major problem. And so von Neumann um, realized that random number generators could be potentially very useful to them as they were developing, say, the atomic bomb. Uh, but I said, well, how the heck do we generate random uh, numbers? And he had this nice quote, anyone who considers arithmetical methods, which are pretty much all you can use on a computer as arithmetical methods, for producing random digits is, of course, in a state of sin. This is a quote from von Neumann, sort of famous uh, mathematician, who sort of um, was, uh, did a lot of things, you know, game theory and all sorts of other things, but one of our, our basic kind of models for computation came from von Neumann, the von Neumann uh, architecture for the modern computer. And uh, so this is von Neumann saying, you know, it's really, it's dangerous stuff business to get in there. And he called it a state of sin, which is a little funny because some of the first documented random number generators were actually developed by Franciscan friars. So it's kind of, you know, an interesting irony there. So um, one place that you can go to to get random numbers is actually books. So this looks like a joke. And I think a lot of people, if you look at the reviews on Amazon, you'll find that some people view this as kind of a joke. But, um, uh, and this is marketed, creative people who like to make use of chance in this work will find this convenient, a convenient source of random numbers. And so this is a book of random numbers. And actually, if you went to the library, um, I don't know if now you can still find CRC text, but at least when I used to go to the library, when I was a student, you could buy or, or you could take out books of random numbers and they would have pages very similar to this book. And so if you needed a string of random numbers, you could find one. You didn't have to ask a computer for it. You could just, okay, say, well, I'm gonna go to page 30 and I'm gonna start with line 10 and I'll just keep moving on down through there and that's why I get my random numbers. And so you can imagine putting a decimal point in front of each one of these things and now you've got uniformly distributed random numbers between zero and one. So that, in theory, is one place where you could get your random numbers. But that doesn't seem very modern. I mean, so now, if you needed a random number, you would just go into Excel, and you would say equals rand in one of the cells, like we did in the Monte Carlo simulation lab. And it would give you a random number between 0 and 1. Or you would use some of these other functions, like rand between. Or you could go into MATLAB, and if you type MATLAB and hit rand, and, or type rand and hit tab, you find all sorts of interesting random number uh, functions here. And so uh, MATLAB also can generate random numbers for you. But I mean, the question we have is, how can we trust that their numbers are you know, random? And where are they getting these random numbers? And so we need to have the ability to evaluate random number generators uh, to be able to sort of say, is this a good source of randomness? And so if we think about you know, what properties might we want in a random number generator that comes out of MATLAB or comes out of Excel, we can then say, well, let's, let's make it a simpler question. What do we want out of the die? You know, we've got this 20-sided die that comes with some board game. Um, you know, what's the properties that I want out of it? Well, I probably, when I roll that die, I probably want every face to come up as uh, with equal chance. So I want a uniform distribution of outcomes across the faces. That's one thing that I want. And the other thing that I want is I probably want that uh, when I roll the die that there's no way to predict the outcome of the next roll from the previous roll. If I have those two features, then I can really work with that. I can build some useful games of chance based on top of that. And it turns out those are the same properties that we want in our pseudo random number generator. We want 
even though it's not truly random underneath it all, we want the numbers that come out of this mathematical formula to be uniform across all the numbers that could come out of them. And, um, and we'll more formally define that next and be independent so that when I draw one number, I can't easily predict what the next number is going to be. Okay, so um, how do we define these things? So in the case of uniformity, what we're saying is if we have a pseudo random number generator that generates numbers between zero and one, then if we divided that interval between zero and one up into little n subintervals of equal length, then the expected number of random numbers we'd find in each interval is just going to be um, the total number of numbers that we drew divided by um, the, um, the number of intervals. And so if I have 10 subintervals and I draw 100 numbers, then hopefully each subinterval from 0 to 0.1, from 0.1 to 0.2, and so on, each subinterval has, on average, if I were to run this experiment multiple times, on average, each subinterval would have only 10 numbers in it. I drew 100 numbers, I had 10 subintervals, so each subinterval better have, on average, 10 numbers in it. And that is sort of the definition of what we mean by uniformity. So that numbers are uniformly clustered across, so that there's no, there's no special area of the number line between zero and one that gets more numbers than others. So as an example for a 20-sided die, a good outcome might be this outcome out here, where I can kind of see that, you know, there's not like any one number that's coming up more often than any other number. A bad outcome might be this one down here because um, I see a lot of repeats. And it's not bad necessarily because they're in a row. It's bad because there's a lot of them. Like there are a whole lot of twos. There are some sevens. There are um, some ones. Um, there's some threes, but uh, hardly any fours. So the fact that there's hardly any fours, there's no fives. You know, I've drawn enough numbers that it's crazy that I have seen so many repeats of the number two, and yet I've never seen any, you know, five. So, so that's what I mean by this is a non-form distribution. It seems like it's over-representing some numbers over others. So that's bad. So we don't want non-uniform, we want uniformity. The other property we want is independence. And so two numbers, two draws of the random number are independent if I can't get any, the, prob the probability of one number does not um, change if I know the outcome from a, a previous draw. So as an example in my die roll here, I can't use one die roll to predict the outcome of another die roll. So in, um, in this first pattern here, I say this is good because I can't, knowing that I rolled a 20 doesn't seem to give me any information about what comes after the 20. You know, if, um, knowing that I rolled a, I'm trying to see if I see any repeats here, but if, um, you know, if I drew a 14 here and a 14 here, I wouldn't want to see the same number that came out of, the, out of the 14 every time I drew a 14. So knowing something about the previous rolls does not tell you about the future rolls. So every roll is independent. You can contrast that with this bad example down here where I can see a pattern is forming. So even though this is clearly uniform, if I drew 100 numbers, it would be the case that I would get them uniformly distributed over the number line. Um, and so this is uniform, this bad one, but it is not independent because I can clearly see whenever I draw a two, then I know the next number is gonna be a three. And if I, whenever I draw a three, I know the next number is gonna be a four. So that means that there's a lack of independence between the roles. One role um, depends upon the other in that if I know the outcome of a previous role, I can predict with high probability the outcome of another role. And it doesn't even have to be high probability. It just has to be um, I've gained information by rolling a die. And it ha it, if, if it's independent, then a previous role should not give me any information about a, a next role. And so those are our two properties we're looking for, uniformity and independence. Remember those. Those are the two most important fundamental properties of a pseudo-random number generator. Those are the ones that if I were to ask you, what are the properties you need of a pseudo-random number generator that you designed, you need to tell me back immediately. It's just like, it should be like the first thing that pops in your mind, uniformity and independence. All right.
So I'm going to pause there. You can pause the video, you know, and uh, think about if you have any questions. If you do have some questions, go to the questions link, put a question in there, go to the discussion board, put a question there, send me an email, go to the Slack channel. We got lots of options for your questions. Now, I do want to stop and do a little attendance exercise. And so again, I'll put the attendance uh, exercise link in the chat for those following the chat on the Zoom cloud uh, stream. And the question here are, what are the two Im most important properties of a PRNG, of a pseudo random number generator? So what are the two things you should immediately think about? And I say the most important properties of a pseudo random number generator. Put those down, that's your next attendance question. All right, you can feel free to pause if you would like. Bathroom breaks, whatever you need. Before we roll on to the, uh, the next uh, content here. All right, so moving forward, what are some methods for generating true random numbers? because we want to generate these random numbers so that we can use them in arena. Well, one option is throwing dice. I keep bringing that up, throwing dice. Now we can have arena throw dice, but we know that dice, they are excellent in generating uniform numbers. The, the uh, quantization is a little bit of a problem. You kind of know that you're going to be limited from one to six, or you know from one to 20. So you're never going to get a 1.5 out of it, but you're never going to get a one to 20. If you divided that number, um, if you divide an output from one to 20 by 20, then you know that you're gonna be able to get, um, you're probably gonna get a halfway decent random number generator, a number between zero and one. It just happens to be that you'll never get 0.15. You'll always get, you know, uh, you'll always get one over 20, two over 20, et cetera. Um, so throwing dice is one option, but not really a practical option for computer-based applications. Uh, drawing from a shuffle deck of cards, another that's a good one, usually drawing from a ball with a well-stirred urn, so like a lottery balls, you know, that's, that's an option. Uh, you can find um, uh, lava lamp random number generators where they aim a camera at a lava, lava amp and they take the pixels into the camera and they do something called a hash function where you could imagine maybe I'm going to add up all the numbers, all the colors in all of the pixels that I see um, in that lava amp lamp. And, um, and then I'm going to take that sum and I'm going to take it modulo 1 million or something like that. And then I'll, then I'll divide it by a million. And so um, that, you know, so the, the contortions of the lava amp are effectively generating the randomness. So, you know, that is, um, I guess, an option. And, uh, but the lava amp moves pretty slowly. So if you draw a lot of numbers, then you're probably going to get a lot of repeats. And so you might get a lack of independence if you start drawing pretty darn quickly from that lava lamp. So um, other options um, here, and I'm sorry, my, uh, my mouse was scrolling the wrong way there. So um, then another option, if you go to random.org, so this is what a lot of my scientific trends, when they need to randomize their experiments, they'll um, you go to random.org and they'll have it generate a random schedule for their treatments and things like that. And, um, and random.org, uh, they use atmospheric noise. And so they have sensors that can sense um, all sorts of fluctuations that are in the atmosphere and they use those as a source of randomness. Now that's great, but again, not really, uh, you know, what if your computer's not on the internet? Uh, again, uh, what if you need to generate huge numbers of, ran uh, huge numbers of random numbers? Um, not really that great. So we need um, our own way to generate uh, halfway decent random numbers um, quickly and a lot of them. So our required features, again, uniformity and independence should pop right in your head, most important features. There also are a couple other desired features that you should remember, but if I were to ask you what are the most important features, you should not give me any of these desired features, you should tell me the required features. The most important features are uniformity and independence. The rest of these are just bonus, but we'd really like them if we can get them. The method should be fast. So you should be able to draw a lot of these random numbers in a short amount of time. The sequences of random numbers should have a sufficiently long cycle. So computer generated sequences will always repeat. So eventually you'll start seeing the pattern repeat itself, but it should repeat after millions of numbers, not hundreds or tens. Um, the other thing that we want is that, um, this is a little harder one to think about, but they, given the same starting point, given that I drew the same first random number, we want to make sure that all of the numbers that, that uh, happen after that follow the same pattern. So 
we don't want the pattern. We want a very long pattern and we want that very long pattern to repeat again after a very, very long amount of time. But we really do want it to be a pattern that if we, if we started anywhere in the pattern, we would get the same pattern out again. You might say, well, why, why do I want there to be a repeatable pattern? And, and the idea is, is that sometimes you will run a simulation and something crazy will happen. Something very rare, but very important will happen. And if you remember how you so-called seeded your random number generator, then you can rerun your simulation with that same seed and you'll get these same random sequences out and you'll then be able to debug in more detail exactly what happened in this random weird re uh, event. So um, in any random number generator, there should be a seed you can put into it that if you start with that seed, it will give you the same sequence out every time. And so it's kind of like having these 20 sided die where if I always roll the red die, I will always get the same sequence out. If I always roll the black die, I'll always get the same sequence out and so on and so forth. Uh, but if I want to get the same sequence back again, so if I want to then say, all right, rerun my factory simulation and see exactly what just happened there, then I just go and I use this red die again. If I want an ensemble of factories to see how well things do on average, then I can run a factory with the red die, a factory with the, with the black die, a factory with the other red die, and so on. So each new seed becomes like an independent sample of the factory, another day of the factory. But each um, die itself, if you rerun the factory with that die, is like rerunning that day of the factory over and over and over again so that you can measure things more detailed. It allows you to turn back time and rerun that day of the factory again. So that's something that we're shooting for. That's what we want. Okay, so in Microsoft Excel, the seeds are chosen internally so that, um, and they're usually chosen, I think, by the timer. And so by the like number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. And so because of that, every time you save a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, if you had a column of random numbers, then you're going to get a, um, a different set of random numbers out. And so at 126.29, this is what it was. And if I hit save and come back or reopen the spreadsheet at 128.06, and then this column is totally different, even though the formulas didn't change. And that's because it, it seeds its random number generator with the, the time. Now in Arena, we have control over that seed and that's for the reasons that I just mentioned. So in Arena, you can actually use this element. So if you were to go into the elements panel on the left-hand side of Arena, there is a seeds block that you can drag on to your Arena sheet and then if you open that up, then it is empty, the seeds list. But if you hit, say, hit add, then you can add a seed. Um, and, this, and you basically can say, um, for a random number stream used in Arena, and the default stream is 10. So if you don't change the stream for your random number generation inside Arena, it uses the stream 10. And you can seed that stream however you'd like. And so you can go in there and choose a five digit number and put that in as your seed value. And every time you run your simulation, as long as that seed value is the same, you'll get the exact same output out. This is exactly why, even though when you run Arena and close it and reopen Arena, some of you might notice that your outputs are identical, like your performance metrics and confidence intervals, they're identical to the previous run of Arena if you had previously closed Arena and reopened it. And that's because by default, there's a certain seed Arena uses. Now, every replication Arena runs of an experiment, it updates the seed, it adds to the seed so that you get a new die roll. But the die that it puts into the first replication is always the same unless you force it to change by using the seeds block. So that's one of the ways we can use these seeds. All right, so any questions about that? Again, if you have questions, please, Slack, discussion board. You can use this link, post it there. You can send an email. And there's the questions link. It's a great time to hit pause if you need a break. All right. Okay, so 
Um, let's skip ahead here and say, well, how the heck do we build these magical mathematical formulas that give us uniformity and independence, the two most important features of a pseudo random number generator? Well, um, an early attempt at this, again, originally first described by a Franciscan friar, but then later reinvented by von Neumann uh, in uh, 1949, is the so called middle square method. So it's mathematical uh, a technique for generating what hopefully would be uniformly distributed random variables between zero and one. The method is we're gonna start with a four digit number, call that a seed, and then we are going to square that number and that will turn it into an eight digit number. If it's not eight digits, just put zeros on the front end of it. So it turns into an eight digit number and then we set our next number, so you could, I guess you can think of it as the next seed, but in you know, the next value, to the middle four digits of that eight digit number. And then our random number output is gonna be that new number divided by 10,000. And then we repeat that process, now using that number in one, which is those middle four digits, going into it as the kind of seed for the next iteration of this algorithm. So notice that because it's for each, each number is four digits long, then dividing them by 10,000 gives me a number between zero and one. And the hope was if you did this, that you would get independence uh, so, that every, um, so that every draw, every number in one would, be, would not allow you to predict the next number in two. And, um, and then the hope would you also would get uniformity and you hopefully would get very long cycles. That was the hope with this. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out with the middle square method. So here's uh, an example. We start with a seed 5197. All right, so here's 5197 squared. 5197 is this eight digit number after it's squared. So we'll grab the middle four. Great. So our first number is gonna be 88. We divide 88 by 10,000, we get 0 .0088, all right? Remembering our place value, 0 .0088. So that is our first random number between zero and one. Looks good, right? It's between zero and one and I couldn't have predicted it. So, so far so good. Problem happens, I square 80, so I take my 88, I square it, and now I get this much smaller number. So I had to pad it with zeros to get it up to eight digits. And now I have this 0077. Well, 77 is not that far from 88. So it's a little concerning, but that might've just been bad luck. Uh, so I'm going to use that as my second number by dividing it by 10,000. I keep doing this process over and over again, and I see that the numbers are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it hits zero. And once it's zero, zero squared is still going to give me an eight digit. You know, eight zeros is my eight digit number, and it's just going to get stuck at zero forever. So it degenerates to zero and then gets stuck there at a fixed point. So that's not good. Another example, let's say, okay, maybe I just chose a bad seed. And that's something we don't really want, uh, this idea of a bad seed, a random number generator. You should be able to put any seed you want in there and it'll generate a good stream of random numbers. Um, but in this one, let's say maybe there's another seed I can use. So I'm gonna choose 6,500. 6,500, all right, great, squared, and I get 2,500 in the middle. So 2,500 is gonna be my, uh, this N1 divided by 10,000, I get 25, looks good. 2,500, square that. And then I get this number, which happens to be different than this number, but they agree on their middle four digits. So that means I get the same uh, number out again. So it degenerates not to zero, it gets stuck at this fixed point where it's 0.25 every time. So it's not uniformly distributed and it's, you know, it's not really independent either. So that's, uh, that's not good. And it can get uh, worse with the middle square method. So you can give a, a seed, 2784, you go through the math, and um, what you find is, okay, 7506, you get 0.7506 would be the number that we get out of that. Uh, 3400 looks good, 5600 looks good, everything's looking fine. But then a couple of numbers later, we end up getting that 5600 out again. And once we get the 5600 out, it just cycles back around, and now you get a cycle where all the next numbers are gonna be 5,600, 3,600, 9,600, 1,600, 5,600, and they're gonna keep going down through there. So even though there were some transients here, which made it look like the pattern was longer than it was, it eventually started cycling. And you see something similar, and this is almost worse. So we start with a seed 9713, 
and you go through this middle square method and you get a long transient of like 83 numbers where you're like, this is looking pretty good. These look like they're uniformly distributed. I can't predict them. They look like they're independent and it looks like I'm getting a long cycle. But then suddenly you hit the unfortunate 4100 here and 4100 starts a short cycle. So then it gets stuck in a pattern of 4100, 8100, 6100, 2100, 4100, 8100, et cetera, et cetera. It just keeps on going forever. So even though you had a very long transient, transient goes away, no good. All right. So middle square method, it's not looking promising. So maybe that's not a good one. So the benefits of it, if it were to work, is it's real simple to implement. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of memory in order to build it. Cons, it's difficult to find a seed. The fact that we even have to find a good seed is sort of a red flag. It tended, has a tendency to generate to zero. It has short cycles. Um, there are a bunch of other attempts at good uh, pseudo random number generators around the same time. So called middle product method is another one you can look up and they have all sorts of similar problems. Now, a little bit later in history, someone came up with the linear congruential generator, the LCG, which you should have some experience with now after the previous homework. And this is the basis of many modern pseudo random number generators. This is a good one, a pretty good one. So this one has four parameters, a seed, not really a parameter, but we'll call it a seed, a multiplier, an increment, and a modulus. And the idea here is that you start with some initial seed, and then starting with that seed to kind of kick things off, you write this formula down where you take your multiplier times the previous seed, you add the increment, and then that number, which might be a large number, you take the modulus with m the modulus, modulo modulus here, and that ensures that the number will not be any greater than the modulus. And then you can divide by the modulus, and that ensures that this division here is going to be between 0 and 1. And so uh, there are special cases. If you get rid of the offset here, then this becomes the mixed congruential generator method. If you, um, I'm sorry, if you don't get rid of the zero, if you leave it the zero, um, uh, if you make it non-zero, if, uh, if you make it zero, it's the multiplicative one, which also has some other names here. But they both can just generally be called uh, the linear congruential generator. People have also generated more nonlinear variants, this inversive one where they add this inverse in between here, and there are reasons to kind of do that, to try to improve upon its properties. Now, the performance of this generator is really, really sensitive to the choices of those three parameters, C, M, and A. So, the, um, so as long as you choose a good set of C, M, and A, and we'll talk about what those good set is, then you can put any seed you want into this thing, and it's going to give you a long cycle of uniformly distributed and independent pseudo-random numbers. So that's good. The maximum period is always going to be the modulus, though. So it won't necessarily go all the way up to the modulus. So if your modulus is 100, you're not ever going to get a cycle longer than 100, and your cycle might be shorter than 100. And if you think that through, you can maybe sort of see, because it's a deterministic function, that um, why that might be the case. But so you know that your modulo is always going to be the limit of how many numbers you get until the cycle. Now, there is a nice mathematical theorem here that says that you will get the full cycle. So if your modulo is 100, then you'll get 100 numbers um, before it repeats. And you get the full period if you choose and this is if and only if, um, A, C, and M that have these three properties. So you can find that the only integer that divides M and C evenly is one, that A minus one is divisible by all prime factors of whatever M you chose, and that A minus one is divisible by four if M is divisible by four. If you have those three things, then, and only then, then are you guaranteed that you will generate a uh, random numbers that cycle um, up until the full period of whatever your modulus is? And so that's a really cool property. So some examples here, and you should have already done this on your um, the previous homework. Um, here's one where I've given a seed and I've given properties A, C, and M, the um, a multiplier, increment, and modulus. So we're gonna start 27 with our um, seed. We're going to multiply it by the multiplier, and then we're going to add the increment. That would give us a large number, so 502. 
and then we're going to take the modulo. So if I do 502 mod 100, it's like dividing 502 by 100. I get a remainder of two. And then I divide that two by the modulus and remember my place value. So two over 100 gives me 0 0.02. So that is my first random number between zero and one. And then I'm going to take that two and I'm going to repeat it. So it now becomes the seed for the next iteration. Otherwise, the formula is identical. And I get 77 divided by 100, 0.77, and so on. So that's the linear congruential generator. And you can get some pretty again, long cycles. And so here's one, uh, 17, 9, and 10,000. Uh, and I picked a seed of 27. So if I do that, then I end up getting um, a cycle of length 2,000. So, and not only do I get a cycle of length 2,000, but if I then take a histogram of these 2,000 numbers, then they're uniformly distributed over the period from zero to one. So that looks pretty darn good. So this is a histogram. I find roughly the same number of numbers in each one of these bins. So that's excellent, right? Now, um, the only downside of these linear congruential generators, and remember this is a downside of them, is that although they have most of the properties we need, usually that modulus that we pick isn't quite long enough to be a useful cycle. I want millions of numbers before I start seeing a cycle of that period. Because I imagine that I like you might generate a factory or a, a, a let's say a, a grocery store simulation. And your grocery store simulation might simulate 30 days of the grocery store. So that's customers that are arriving for 30 days at the grocery store. That is a lot of inter-arrival times between the customers, not to mention all of the other random variables. If you start cycling in the middle of your 30-day simulation, it may as well be a four-day simulation if the cycles you know, happen after four days. I need 30, you know, I need all of that randomness for the entire 30 days of the simulation. And that's why I might need millions of random numbers before the pattern repeats again. So I can't quite get that out of a standard linear congruential generator. But what you can do is you can combine two linear congruential generators to generate a new random number generator that has all of the properties of a linear congruential generator, but a much, much longer cycle. And so this is an example here. I built a linear congruential generator uh, in X. I built another one in Y. And I just add them together and then mod some modulus M here. And this combined linear congruential generator can potentially, if X and Y have, um, this can have a small period X and this can have a small period Y. But because these two aren't in sync, then the combination of them together is going to have a larger period. So um, as uh, an example here, here is one linear congruential generator in X. Here is another linear congruential generator in Y. Each one of these already has a pretty long period. So this is actually it's a multiplicative generator. If I combine these two together, and they actually use that negative in the combination here, the combination has an extremely large period, two times 10 to the 18th. So it generates that many numbers until it starts repeating. So that's great. And since then, you can get even larger. So here's a, um, a simpler example worked out for you. Here is a linear congruential generator here that has a period of four in X. Here is a linear congruential generator with a period of three in Y. So you can see three, zero, two, one, three, and then it's gonna repeat zero, two, one, three, zero, two, one, three. It repeats every four. In Y, it repeats every three, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, repeats every three. But if I subtract them together, then here is the subtraction, 101, negative one, three, one, zero, one, as you see, is this just subtraction. And if I take the modulo, so I take the modulus of that, that turns them into a positive number between zero and this modulus of three. And even though the modulus only goes up to three, um, then I still don't get a period, a cycle, until um, 12. And so I get a pattern, 101, 202, et cetera. So I even hit one again. But even though I hit one in the pattern, and that's how the pattern started, this one is followed by a two, even though this one was still followed by a zero. This one zero is followed by a one, even though this one zero is followed by a zero. But eventually the pattern repeats. So this one is going to then be followed by zero, one, two, et cetera. 
So this is a much longer period than any of these periods because kind of these two are independent of each other and these two have a different period themselves. And that different period creates kind of what we call a beat in music. And that beat has a different frequency than any of these two frequencies. So that's the beauty of the combined linear congruential generator. And you can get ones that have extremely long periods. So that's kind of the modern pseudo random number generator is probably going to be a combined linear congruential generator. So that's probably what's running in a lot of the random number generators that are out there in commercial software. There are certainly more complicated examples, but that's, uh, that's that. So again, any questions, you know what to do. Go to the question page, send me an email, um, go to uh, Slack, uh, et cetera. Let, let's do one more attendance question. So the attendance question here, I'll put the um, attendance question in the chat for those following along in the chat on the Zoom chat. And the question that I have here is, um, is that linear, what, so linear congruential generators are great. What is the potential problem with a simple linear congruential generator? And I guess the question is, what problem is a combined LCG, CLCG, meant to solve relative to a normal LCG? So that's my attendance question for you there. All right. So let's wrap up the lecture here. And now we need to talk about how we're going to test for these two most important properties of uniformity and independence. So we're gonna start seeing some tests that hopefully you might remember from 380 and 385. So uniformity, already kind of described uniformity. Uh, we want numbers kind of spread equally across the number line. So our null hypothesis in this case, in this case when we're testing for goodness of fit, the null hypothesis is then a good result. So we wanna say under the null hypothesis of uniformity, then we would get random numbers that would be uniformly distributed across zero and one. We're gonna apply a statistical test which will test for this hypothesis. And if it rejects the hypothesis, then we have a bad generator. And then because then we've sort of shown evidence that it is not uniformly distributed. If it does not reject the, the, the um, hypothesis, then hopefully we've chosen a test for uniformity that has so-called high statistical power, which we'll talk about later after the midterm, but high statistical power means that we can feel pretty confident that we can sort of accept the hypothesis, at least within kind of some uh, range. So generally we don't ever accept hypotheses, we only reject hypotheses, so that's kind of the phrasing I want you to use, but I'm kind of looking ahead to say there are special types of tests that are pretty good at, um, at, at not, um, and that when you don't reject a hypothesis, you can be pretty okay with assuming that the hypothesis is probably true. So that's kind of what we're shooting for here. Now, what sort of statistical test? Well, I mentioned to you before, the definition of uniformly distributed between zero and one means that if you divided zero and one into bins, and then counted the number of things that show up in those bins, then you would get on average the same number in every bin. And whenever I tell you that we are going to test for um, counts to see if actual counts meet expected counts, your head as a statistician should go to one statistical test in particular. I'm gonna turn on the light here as you think about that. So, um, you, if you think back into 380 and 385, what statistical test do you use that involves counting? It involves testing the number of uh, counts that you actually got in, a, in an experiment with the expected number of counts that you got in an experiment. When you think counts, so here the count counts, you should think chi-squared. The chi-squared test is a test of counts. And so if I have expected counts and I have actual counts, the chi-squared test is how I compare them rigorously in a statistically rigorous way. So um, the only downside of the chi-squared test is you have to have enough expected counts to work. In this class, enough is five. And so as long as your expected counts in every bin are at least five, you can use a chi-squared test. If it's less than five, we have to use another test and we'll talk about that in just a second. 
So in the chi-squared test, um, we're going to divide the hypothetical interval into n classes. So on a midterm, I will tell you how many classes to divide it into. In real life, you're going to have to decide that on your own. Uh, so you'll get better at that as we move on with this. So if you um, end up finding that the number of samples you have divided by the number of bins that you're putting them in, if that, which this is the expected number that you'd see in every bin if it was uniformly distributed, if that is less than five, do not use a chi-squared test. All right, if it's greater than five, you can continue. You count how many real outcomes showed up in those bins, and that can be less than five, and that's fine, but the expected number has to be uh, five or greater, and we'll talk about why in a, in a lecture in the future after the midterm. So then you can calculate this statistic, the chi-squared statistic, and we'll also talk about after the midterm where this crazy statistic comes from, because it looks like the units shouldn't work out or something. And so for every bin, you have an expected number of counts and you have an observed number of counts. You take the difference between those and square them and then divide that by the expected difference. Again, it's weird to take a square and then divide it. It almost looks like a fraction, but the square kind of screws that up. But it's right to do this. This should not be E squared or anything like that in the bottom there. And again, in a future lecture, we'll talk about where this formula comes from. And, um, and then again, for a uniform distribution, this expected number is just the number of observations you have divided by the number of bins you've chosen. And then if this chi-squared value is too large, and so we have to look up in a table to figure out what we mean by too large, then we reject the hypothesis of uniformity. You can think of the chi-squared statistic as the distance from the expected distribution. So if that distance is too large, then we are not meeting the, expect the expected distribution. Now, what defines too large? Well, I'll give you an alpha, which is our, um, uh, our significance level, which is generally going to be 0.05. And there is a so-called degrees of freedom, which for a chi-squared test, that would be the number of bins minus one. So if you go to table A6 in your textbook, then you can look up these critical values for the chi-squared test. So you go down in the column for alpha and you look at the row for degrees of freedom or maybe it's flipped columns and rows and that tells you the maximal distance you can be away from the expectation for it to sort of just be chalked up to chance. Once you're farther away than that, then you have to say that we reject uniformity as our hypothesis. So here's a numerical example. Here's a bunch of observations. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, let's divide those, uh, the, the interval into four, four bins, zero to 0 0.25, 0.25 to five, 0 0.5 to 0 0.75, 0 0.75 to one, four bins. Then we're going to count the number of observations in each bin, in each class. So if I go through all of these 30 observations, then I get three in the first uh, interval, four in the second, eight in the third, 15 in the fourth. Already, this is not looking very uniform, right? Because I got 15 here and three here. That doesn't look like that could happen by chance. But let's see. The expected number in this is going to be my 30 observations divided by my four bins. That's seven and a half. So I would expect if this is uniformly distributed, the average number should be about seven and a half. That's above five. So it is okay to use the chi squared test. So then I plug it into my chi squared formula and I get this number 11.8. 11.9, and I have to ask, is that number too big? Is it too far away from the expected distribution? I go in, I look at the table for an alpha of 0.05 and a degrees of freedom of three. Remember, I used four bins, so the degrees of freedom is three. We'll talk about what we mean by degrees of freedom in the lecture after the midterm. Then I get a critical value of 7.81. That is the maximal distance that we can be away from the expected distribution to just chalk up the difference to be chance. Any higher than that, then we're pretty sure that these numbers are distributed in some other way. And that's basically what we're going to conclude, is that because 11 is higher than 8, then we're going to say that we reject the hypothesis of uniformity. These numbers are not uniformly distributed. If you have questions about that, you know what to do. Let's roll forward so we can get through um, the other cases here. All right, so what happens if you don't have an expected value of five or more. In that case, you can't use 
the um, chi-squared test. And instead, you use an approach uh, by sorting. And so you're going to sort the numbers. And if you sort the numbers, then the number that is in the sort of ith position in the list should be closest to i minus 1 divided by the total number of, of uh, numbers and i divided by the total number of numbers. In other words, if you sort all the numbers, then the numbers, uh, if they're uniformly distributed, then as you go down through your sorted list of numbers, you kind of should move roughly the same distance between every number. You shouldn't get a cluster of numbers up front and then suddenly jump to the end. If you sort them, they should be spread all across the line. And so that's what we're going to do in the so-called kolmogorov smirnov or KS test. This is the test you use when you have a small number of samples so that when you divide, um, if you were, so that you can't bin them into bins where the chi-squared test uh, works and does anything useful. So in this case here, I've given uh, five numbers. I sorted them. And then I end up comparing them each to i divided by n, so 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So this is 1 divided by 5, 2 divided by 5, 3 divided by uh, 5, and so on. And underneath here, this is 0 divided by 5, 1 divided by 5, 2 divided by 5, and so on. And this top row is just going to be the, the top row minus the middle row. Those are all these distances. And if it's negative, I don't need to calculate it because I won't use it. And in the bottom row, this is just the middle row here minus the bottom row. And again, if it's negative, I won't use it. And so I'm going to look at all of these numbers, and I'm going to take the maximal number, which in this case is 0.26, and that ends up being my distance from the expected distribution. And that'll be the thing. This is 0.26 here that I look at a statistical table to see if I'm too far away from my expected distribution. So I look at table 8A, for example. And it tells me that for an alpha, a significance level 0.05, and a degrees of freedom of 5. So for the, chi, for the KS test, the degrees of freedom are just the number of samples. And it tells me that my critical distance away is 0.565. And so this uh, distance um, here is, um, is greater than the distance that I measure here. So in that case, I'm not going to reject. So because my measured distance away from uniformity is not bigger than the threshold distance, then I do not reject uh, uniformity. This does not mean that these numbers can be accepted as uniform, but it just means that I don't have enough evidence to reject them from uniformity, that uh, they're still consistent with uniformity. So if I were to draw five numbers, only five numbers, those five numbers might as well you know, fit within this. Now, the mechanism behind here, I'm probably going to skip over in this lecture, just so we don't run uh, too late, because we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But, um, but basically, it involves measuring the difference between the, um, the empirical CDF, so the approximate cumulative distribution function, and the desired cumulative distribution function. And so effectively what we're doing here, and I'm just going to jump ahead to this slide here, is that the kind of jagged number here, if I were to draw a thousand numbers uh, that are from a uniform distribution between zero and one, if I were to sort them, so all the numbers are on the x-axis and their ranks in the sorting were on the y-axis, and so I'm just dividing their ranks by a thousand so that this goes between zero and one, then if they're uniformly distributed, they basically are going to form a ramp. And so that's sort of what we're saying is what's the distance between the, the shape that they fit or the shape that they take when you sort them and the expected shape, which in a uniform distribution is a ramp. So as a contrast, if I were to draw uh, numbers from a Weibull distribution, if I were to sort a thousand of those numbers, then this black squirrely line would be what I would get, where all of the numbers that I uh, sorted are going to be on the x-axis. And their rank in the sorting is on the y-axis, again, divided by 1,000, just to make it between 0 and 1. And this S shape is very far away from this diagonal shape, which would be the expected uh, shape if they were uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. All right. All right. So um, 
we're you know, about to run just a little late in this asynchronous lecture, but I want to make sure we cover one more test. And that, um, so there's a lot more that's in this lecture, but I want to make sure we at least get the runs test down here. So the one thing that we have not tested yet is independence. We've tested uniformity, but not independence. And so independence is the hypothesis that under the null hypothesis, that if I, um, <clears throat> if I draw a sample, then it does not improve my ability to predict the next sample. And so if there is a lot of correlation between earlier samples and later samples, then I can reject the hypothesis of independence. So I don't want to reject the hypothesis of independence. I want to um, be able to sort of take a bunch of numbers in and say these don't reject independence. And so this, uh, if, you know, as an example here, if I generate a bunch of numbers like this one on the, on the, on the right here, so this is like 500 numbers and some of them are, um, go all the way up to four, some of them go all the way up to negative four. If I zoom in on a region, let's say from zero to 50, here's what this looks like. This here, uh, the question is, are these numbers independently drawn? So um, it does knowing a little bit about these early numbers tell me anything about these later numbers. And there is a so-called test of autocorrelation where I basically end up taking this sequence and then I treat it, um, I pair each number with one of the later numbers and then I generate a scatter plot. And if I generate a scatter plot where on the x-axis it's kind of like the first number and the y-axis is wh whatever number it's paired with in which comes from later in the sequence, if that scatter plot looks like it has a shape, like a cigar, then there's a significant correlation between earlier, uh, plot, between earlier numbers and later numbers. And the distance between numbers, so if I'm correlating an earlier number and a later number, that distance between them is a so-called lag. And so we can generate what's called as a cross lag correlation, or uh, we can generate what's called an autocorrelation graph, which is down here, where this is basically saying, what is the correlation coefficient between uh, my data and my data one lag later, or two lags later, or three lags later? And I get a plot that might look like this, like and this is what I would for these data up here. And so if you have a lag of zero, then you're saying, if I know a data point, how much does it correlate with itself? Well, if I know a data point, I know 100% about the current data point. So its correlation is 100%. But what this is showing is that if I know a data point and I look at how much it correlates to the data point right after it, then I've actually got a correlation of pretty high here. You know, I've got like, this is like 0.3 or something like that. And so this means I've got, you know, that the, these two points are probably not independent. I actually get a little bit of information. And as I lag gets longer, then I kind of lose my predictive ability until it goes into this blue region, which is basically means that it's noise, that I, that I, I, I don't get any more predictive ability out of it. Uh, but it turns out that if I keep looking at the lags, then there's some periodicity in this signal which is hard to see, but it comes out right here in the autocorrelation graph. And that periodicity shows up so that there are periodic, you know, every say five um, lags, I end up picking up some predictability. And that's because there's some hidden periodicity that's in this. And so this is not an independent sequence. So this is one way to test for independence, to do one of these autocorrelation graphs. The downside in this kind of autocorrelation test and, um, and that's if we were to jump again, is that it's a bit cumbersome and problematic to do one of these tests. And so, uh, because it re requires calculating each one of those lags. And there's a bunch of problems with that that I'm not gonna go into because I'm already a little over time. So instead, I'm gonna introduce the test that we will use and then I'll let you go. So the test that we will use is something called a runs test, which is a much simpler than this. Um, this focuses on runs that have a similar feature. And so if they, um, uh, you know, if, if you were flipping coins, you, then you kind of would say, how often do I get heads in a row? You know, if I get heads, 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 that could happen if I flip the coin. 
but then the question of I got, you know, all heads, you know, for five uh, flips and then all tails for five flips and then all heads for five flips and all tails five slip flips, even though each one of those runs could happen, then the fact that I'm getting a bunch of those runs and they're all five long, then that kind of suggests that there's something weird with this coin and that maybe I don't have coins that have independent coin flips. And so, um, so that's what we're going to do with random numbers is we're going to kind of turn them into, we're going to ask, are there commonalities that are shared between adjacent um, uh, trials of the random number? Now, there are a bunch of different ways to do runs test. In this class, we're going to do a runs above and below test. You may have found, say, sample solution sets for earlier versions of 475 taught by other faculty where they do, instead of a runs above and below, um, there's a runs up and down test, for example. There are a bunch of other different runs tests. Um, and those tests are going to be slightly different. I chose the runs above and below because it works just as well as those other ones. And I think it's easier to teach and easier to use. But, you know, so don't go back to like old midterms from some other faculty who taught 475 and learn how to do their runs test and then try to do that on a midterm. I've seen that happen before because then you'll do a lot of work, but you're going to get the wrong answer. Okay, so a runs above and below. This um, is basically going to convert a random number string into how many random numbers are above the mean, how many random numbers are below the mean, and that's going to turn any random number string into heads or tails coin flip. And then we're basically going to say we know that if it was a independent coin flip, we know how many runs of heads, 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 heads we would get. And so we're going to compare the distribution that we would get with a coin flip in runs to how many runs we actually get with the random numbers that we generate. And you can do this automatically in major commercial software packages like MATLAB using the runs test. But we're going to try this by hand. So the basic process here is I give you these random numbers, and then you're going to calculate the mean of these random numbers and then ask how many are above the mean or below the mean. And so above the mean will be NA, below the mean will be NB. And then once you've converted them into above the mean and below the mean, then you're going to count the number of runs. So each run is a contiguous string of outcomes that are all above or all below. So if I have 30 numbers, you might see like heads, 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 or above, 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 below, below, above, above, above. Well, that's three runs. We had above, below, and above. That's three runs. And so I'll see an example, a concrete example of that. So once I know how many runs there are and how many are above and how many are below, then I end up calculating this is if it was a binomial variable, so if it was independently distributed, then we know that the mean and variance would have this formula. The mean would relate to those numbers that you just calculated with this formula, and the variance would relate to this many numbers in uh, this formula. And this is the mean and variance of how many runs you would get. So that sets up a test statistic that we can use to say, well, then how many runs did I get? And would I have expected to get this number of runs if I assume that this really is independent and it would, should be described by a binomial random variable? And it turns out that, um, that then if our number of runs are is far away from the expected number of runs scaled by the standard deviation, and notice this is a standard deviation, so the square root of this formula, then we're going to reject independence. And what do we mean by far away? Well, that we're just going to look in a Z table using um, our, our level of significance is 0.05. So you have to look in the table for 0.025. So that's the alpha over two. So we're going to look in that Z table and that's going to tell us if um, we are not independent. And so um, as our concrete example here, I'm given 30 data points and I want to know are these independent? So I'm going to calculate the mean of these 30 numbers. And on a midterm, I would probably just give you the mean. So it's 0.67. Then I'm going to convert those numbers all into above or below. And so basically, if, I, if they're above the mean, I replace them with a 1. If they're below the mean, I replace them with a 0. So you see this goes 0, 0, 1. Well, that's because this is below the mean, this is below the mean, and this is above the mean. And it is critically important that you do not sort the numbers. So the numbers have to stay in the original order, because once you sort them, you've actually introduced 
dependence. You've, you've obliterated independence. So they, the only difference between an independent sequence of numbers and a dependent sequence of numbers is basically whether it's sorted or not. A maximally unsorted list of numbers is independent and a maximally sorted list of numbers is dependent. So do not sort the numbers. Just leave them in the order they were given. Okay, so then we count the number of runs. So um, I'm gonna take this string here and just to make it easier, I'm gonna break it up here into, um, so if I can get out of here, okay, so I can advance the next slide. So what I've done is I've taken that string of numbers up here and I've just isolated all of the runs. And so zero, zero, that's a run. A singleton one, that's a run. Zero, zero, that's a run and so on. So we have all of those and that's broken up into, it looks like 19 runs, okay? So those 19 runs, um, that is my R, that is my number of runs. So I just count one, two, three, four, five, all the way down through here, 19 runs. 30 numbers, but 19 runs. So those are my three numbers that I calculated, my statistics I took, the number above, the number below, and the number of runs. So from there, I can say if this was independent, then this should act like a weighted coin and the, the, and the weight of that coin is going to be set by the number of above and the number of below. So now I have to say how many runs would a weighted coin give me with these weights? And on average, a weighted coin would give me um, an average number of 15.7 runs when I have 30 uh, uh, flips of that coin. And it's gonna give me a variance of about seven. So I can convert that variance into a standard deviation, and then I can say, all right, so what's the z-score for the number of runs that I calculated from the actual data? And so R19 minus my expected number of runs for a weighted coin with these statistics, divided by the standard deviation, and notice, be careful, there's a square root there, a square root of the variance. That gives me a number of 1.24. So the question is, is that too far? Well, if I look at my table of standard normal values, then for a one-tailed table here, that's what was why I have to do the alpha over two, then if I choose a, um, a significance level of 0.05, then I look at the 0.025 here, and it shows me 1.96 is my critical number. And you should memorize 1.96 because that number shows up in a bunch of different places and it will show up later in this class in a bunch of different places as we convert from standard error to confidence intervals and all that you should just commit 1.96 to your memory as an important number and so because 1.23 is less than 1.96 then we can say that the number of runs observed falls within kind of the expected distribution of runs we would get if these were independently distributed uh, numbers and so we do not reject the hypothesis of independence. All right, so there's more I can say about that. Um, I will go over that example again in the next lecture. Uh, so went a little over here, so uh, I'll mention that in the canvas that this lecture goes a little over, but you can stop at the runs test. And so, um, uh, and so, but you got that example there. So if you have any questions, again, feel free to fill out the questions. Um, and, um, and that is about all that I want to say today. So next lecture, we're going to then do the inverse transform method. So what do we do once we have these random numbers? Um, how do we actually turn them into these random variants? That's what we do next lecture. And so the attendance question here, um, then I'll say this is the final attendance question. And, um, and actually, because I'm going to tell you guys that you don't have to watch it all the way to the end, then um, I am not going to ask an attendance question here. And, um, and so the previous attendance questions will all that will be required for this lecture. But um, and thank you for watching it to the end here. So, all right. Uh, so I will see you synchronously on Tuesday, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. If you have any other questions, feel free to come to office hours on Thursday at 4 p.m. as usual.